thank you so much. Happy to be here, and it's happy to see Daryl's uh, talk. And I can inform that we still do the Jemba walks. And even during COVID, it was really hard, virtual Jemba walks in the factory. But um, we're happy to have, the, have his lean background, and we're from uh, Sampumnaden and uh, Lysaker. Yeah. So uh, Kongsberg is the company we're from. We're from Kongsberg Discovery, which is the youngest uh, kid on the block. Just made uh, 13 days ago. It's carved out of, uh, of uh, Kongsberg Maritime. Uh, and we're very happy about that. Kongsberg is the uh, industrialization company, uh, around 11,000 employees. Uh, and we do lots of different things. Um, we do space things here in Horten. We do uh, defense things and digital things. But here, and from discovery, we're mostly concerned about the deep sea. So with this, we have quite a lot of different uh, technologies and sensor types and things we are building. But our talk today will focus mainly on the hydroacoustic part of it. So um, Kongsberg makes uh, sensors, high-end sensors, and we excel the most when it's really hard or, or difficult to do it. So lots of people can make hydroacoustic sensors for the first 50 meters. But uh, when it's time for Kongsberg, we're in the thousands of meters or down to 10,900 meters. Right? That, that's when we come into play for it. So our whole existence is based on uh, the propagation of sound in water. And if you go and visit our stand, we'll have the small sound generating sensors there. So you can see how they work. But we found out that sound waves move like this and hit the target like that. And if we uh, control it and put many, many of those sensors together, we, we see that we can create beams in, uh, well, sound beams. And you see they become more and more narrow as we add more and more sound sources. So that's, that's what we do. We do electronic control of many, many speakers and set them together and then work with that sound. So it will look something like this. This is the sound that we are sending out. And what, you ha what we have to do it with it is a lot of filtering and a lot of beam forming. Right? So we can create beams and control both where we're sending and what we're listening to. And as you saw with the, the thin beam, the more, the more of these speakers we have, the better it is. So these are the actual speakers on an actual vessel. So our uh, most common vessel to put these things on are this. This is Kumpin Sokon, large Norwegian uh, research vessel. And we want that because we fit, you can fit a lot of speakers underneath, right? We make arrays that are maybe 16 meters long, full of speakers like that. We can, that enables us to do really thin beams, so we can read data really well. We do maybe a quarter of a degree on the biggest ones. But sometimes, even a quarter of a degree is not enough, right? especially when it comes, uh, goes far down into the water. We need to be either closer or have even bigger arrays. So to do that, we have made um, a submarine, well, autonomous submarine, where we can mount these sensors on. Right? This, this brings us cl close enough so that maybe half a degree or a quarter of a degree is good enough to get really high resolution. But we can do better. So if we can control how this moves through water and do it really precisely and then use sensors to monitor how it turns and, and yaws, we can add a technique, which is kind of common in radar, uh, synthetic apertures sonar. Right? So this sets together lots and lots of readings. And it takes into account how the submarine moves into one very precise points. And if we do that correctly and, and then make sure that the vessel goes really straight, we can increase the resolution quite, uh, quite a lot. Take it from down from maybe 20 centimeters into the two, three centimeter range. And this allows us to see lots of things uh, with high detail without going really close to it. So this is uh, examples of data that we found. 
This is oil barrels in the Drummond's Fjord. If you're looking for sustainability, we should maybe stop dropping those, but we at least have the tools to detect them, find them, and, and have them cleaned up. And if we push our limit on the acoustics, we're able to do images like, uh, images like this um, of a submarine here in the Oslo Fjord, where we can get all of the fine details, look at quite closely, and we can do that from quite far, far apart, maybe on a, up to 500 meters, 600 meters, something like that. We are able to generate these sound images. So this is well and good. Um, but the introduction of vessels like the submarine and also our surface uh, vessels like Sounder, they, it has um, started producing enormous amounts of data. Right? These Sounders produce uh, maybe a terabyte of data every day as they go out and survey, and, and we're sending them out for up to 20 days at a time. And these are putting hard strain on the scientists that have to interpret the data. And for that, we have found that we need uh, young blood and uh, smart researchers that can help us with automatic, automatic methods. So I'll hand it over to Christian. Sure. Uh, you can hear me? Perfect. Perfect. All right. So like Arne said, the ocean is really, really big. That's what we found out over many years. And uh, trawling over large areas creates a ton of data. And we want to find objects in that data. We want to find, say, fish shoals. We want to find gas seeps and pipelines. We want to find shipwrecks. We want to find things that will help the world, both in sustainability, but also for industry. And to have a person do that physically takes a lot of time. And it can also kind of put a detriment to our autonomous solutions, because maybe you want there to be some decision making. Say you want an autonomous drone to find something and then go back if it thinks it's interesting. You want to remove the human element from that. So we're going to talk about a couple instruments that we have, a couple acoustic sensors, and how we run machine learning pipelines on them, despite our data, to uh, do automatic acoustic object detection, and what we can find in those different instruments, because they do vary use case-wise. So we're going to highlight two of them. One's called the EK80, and one's the EM2040. And the difference between them is that they're both echo sounders. They have these transducers that use sound to measure distance. But one is a single beam, a split beam echo sounder, and the other one is a multi beam. So instead of having one transducer that sends this, array, this uh, beam of data, you have an array. So it's comparable to a LIDAR in that sense. We're going to go more into the details afterwards, but uh, the use cases for these vary. But uh, object detection in both the sensor data, both from the EM2040 and the EK data, is very relevant. We want to do it in both the data streams. Yeah, so I'm going to start off with the EM2040 because I think it's the most uh, comparable to the other sensors you guys might have been uh, familiar with, like a LIDAR. So what we get out of this is high resolution point clouds. Very, very high resolution. As Arna said, we can get a terabyte a day, but we could also, say, generate uh, one gigabyte a minute uh, per trawl. So it's a lot of data, and it's very high resolution. In addition to this, the sensors will put underneath a vessel, usually, and map the ocean floor, which means that if the boat's rocking back and forth, we have to constantly correct for the deviation and pitch roll and yaw, which is a very difficult, difficult job to do. But like we said, it's high resolution, which means objects under water are very easily to be identified. You guys saw the tires and the barrels. You could easily tell what it was. So that's helping our use case a lot. And an often used case for these two instruments is that you have the EM2040, and it's very recognizable what you find in the data. But to measure its size, you need something that's better calibrated, and then use something called the EK80 to measure the size or volume of it. So that's a use case for maybe something that could use both instruments in the same, same vessel. Yeah, so here's an example of EM2040 multi-beam data. This is a pipeline, which is, of course, something we would like to be able to detect for gas seeps and for oil industry. And of course, there'll be other objects that we want to detect, like uh, marine debris and shipwrecks. And these objects can vary in size. You can think about the tires and the, the barrels he showed in comparison to a shipwreck. You know, these are very varied size in object. Uh, and of course, resolution will then vary depending on the depth, how far down it is. Then the beams split a bit more, and you get less resolution per object. So these are all issues we have to take into account when thinking of an automatic method that can identify and classify what uh, objects there are. And like we said, uh, it's one gigabyte per minute of data occasionally, and that is a lot for memory issues when it comes to machine learning. You can't really put the entire point cloud into a model and say, okay, what's here? Because often uh, with modern methods, uh, they will run out of memory. They'll ask for 16 terabytes of memory or something, and you're like, okay, well, this isn't applicable. And another thing to point out about our data from the EM2040 is that pretty much most, if not all, the points will always belong to the seabed. 
and we're not really interested in the seabed for this case, we want to find the objects. So one of the first things we thought of was that if we can approximate what the seabed was, we know that everything that isn't the seabed is what we're interested in. That's what's the anomalies. And that is the kind of backbone to our uh, unsupervised method for object detection, at least the first couple steps of it. So this is the pipeline we proposed for, well, this is one of the pipelines we proposed for object detection in EM2040 data. This is an example of a very flat ocean floor with two moorings, uh, which is like an anchor with a chain, a big concrete block with a chain. And uh, our pipeline, as it is now, is semi-supervised, which means we don't need a lot of annotated data, but we need a little bit. And the first two steps are unsupervised completely. So the first step is we have to find what is the seabed. We have to approximate it, linearize it. Second step is clustering, which means the part of the data that isn't the seabed, how many objects are there, how big are they? And then the third part is classification, which is, OK, we have these object subsets. How do we know if they're of interest or not? Is it a rock? Is it some debris? Is it a landmine? You know, whatever it is, or sea mine. You, know, you want to be able to say if it's of interest or not, and what, what it plays to the decision making of an autonomous vehicle. So the seabed filtering, uh, we have two steps in this. One of it is the approximation stage which uses something called RANSAC. Has anyone, does anyone know what RANSAC is? Well, perfect. But it's basically a model fitting algorithm, often used in camera calibration. But we apply it to the ocean data. And what we do basically is that we will iteratively look for planes, geometric planes, in the ocean floor data, see how many we can find, and then say, OK, if we have points that are lying on a plane, we would be it small or large, they're part of the seabed, because flat, uh, or flat points in the point cloud often belong to the seabed more than an object. And we repeat this until we can't find any more. Uh, we repeat this until we can't find a, a good approximation. And of course, for each approximated seabed plane, we uh, want the objects. We don't want pits and we don't want holes. So we will use a filter that will filter out what is underneath these plane approximations. So you do this iteratively for small point clouds like this that are very flat. It will need to run one or once or twice because it can very easily approximate this as a plane. But uh, for very unlinear and large point clouds, this will take longer time because you have to use more planes to kind of linearize the dynamics of the ocean floor. But of course, it is applicable to both scenarios. So this is how RANSAC works. This is a little GIF of a 2D version of what you kind of could expect. So what we do is we randomly select three points in the plane, in the uh, point cloud, and we use them as corners in, as a geometric plane. And then we look at the plane we've just created, and we say, OK, how many points are close to this plane? If there's not many points close to it, then it's not a good approximation. It doesn't really represent the seabed. But if many are quite close, that means it's a good approximation. It's a very flat area in the point cloud, and most likely, it's part of the seabed. Can't say, of course, that it is, but it is most likely. And we'll do this iter iteratively, especially for larger seabeds. This will take a couple iterations, be more on linear. And uh, if we cannot find a seabed plane approximation of a certain size or with a certain number of uh, points on it, we say, OK, then we can't find any more seabed. We've done what we can, kind of, to filter it out. And by the end of this uh, algorithm, we'll have two sets. We'll have the blue set, which is, of course, seabed points. And then we have the white set, which is stuff that's anomalies, things that may we might be interested in. So when we find a plane, this is the filtering part when it comes to holes and pits, because uh, you want to get rid of those two, optionally. Uh, we find additional points that are underneath the plane, and we filter out those two. So you see on the left there, you have quite uneven terrain in some parts. That will show up in the anomaly set, but we only want the objects. We just want the shipwreck. So what we do is we filter it out, and then you see on the right, we only get a couple anomalies that are not really of interest. And we're going to come back to this because, of course, this is a linearization. It's approximation. So it won't always be perfect. You will still have anomalies that you would say, OK, especially on the right there, the bottom left corner, you would say those are part of the seabed too. So we will introduce that as well in the classification stage, where we have one final step to say, OK, is this still part of the seabed? And we'll train based on these clusters. So what we have now is one uh, set of points that are blue, part of the seabed, and one that are white, part of things that we're interested in. And the set of uh, points that are white, of course, is much smaller and easier to work with than the seabed set. So we do clustering. I'm not going to go too much into this, because it's kind of something many people know about, and it's not too, uh, too unique to us. But we do have this set, and we want to basically say, OK, which points are part of which objects. And we have done this through a graph-based method, method, where we generate edges between points that are within a certain distance of each other. And then we run an algorithm called connected components, which just basically goes from point to point, goes through all the paths it can find, and attaches them to the same object. 
So this is a little bit slow, but of course it is scalable to very large objects and very a lot, many objects. So that's the benefits of using a graph-based method with connected components as opposed to something like uh, dbscan or another density-based uh, algorithm, which might not be scalable. And finally, after the clustering stage, we have individual graphs, each representing an object. We want to know what they are. So we have something called the GCN, which is the graph convolutional network, which just tells you what a graph is. We can put a graph into it, and we can get out a class, maybe saying if it's part of a seabed terrain or if it's part of something that we're interested in, like a shipwreck or a barrel. And how you do this is that you represent the graph. If you just look on the left there, that's the graph we would have, say, as an object with four nodes and edges. You can represent this as a matrix, like on the right, where you have the nodes as the dimensions, and then you have for a one or a zero, zero saying if they're connected or not. So this is called a neighbor matrix. And that looks a lot like a, an input tensor. So we put that into a machine learning algorithm, we train it, and then we can identify which objects belong to which class, and by that have object detection fully pipelined and throw a <laughs> point cloud in and you get objects out. That's what we want with a minimal amount of data, because this is the only stage you would need to train on training data with labels. And labeling is just saying, okay, this graph is this class, this graph is this class, so it's not very arduous uh, work-wise. So I'm gonna go through some demos where we had uh, only 20 point clouds to train on, so a very minimal, minimal set of data. And the first example is by a dock, where you have a couple of visible objects, like a log and some rocks. And we sort them into the seabed set first, of course, that's the dark blue set. And then we have individual objects, color-coded. And of course, they're all, give, all uh, given uh, classes. So the class number zero is actually a seabed class. It will basically say, okay, these are just anomalies in the terrain that we're not very interested in. So as you can see, it's able to sort out which objects are of interest and are not quite well. So this is the first example. This is my favorite example, because this has a little dinghy on it. And of course, we also have some pretty rough coverage on the, on the seabed on the left and right. So here we have a lot more terrain anomalies than if it was flat but these have all mostly been sorted into the seabed class. And then we have the dinghy, of course, uh, isolated out as its own uh, object. And finally, you have something else quite recognizable, uh, like the data set he showed earlier, which is the tire. So you have the tire on the seabed, and then you see on the right it's sorted into its own class and uh, uh, separated out. And of course, these uh, point clouds are all in the UTM, or they can be projected to the UTM coordinate system. So once you have an object out of the pipeline, you also have its position. So then you can say, okay, I know there's a tire there. I can go there and pick it up. Kind of the, the, uh, the goal and for the environmental uh, aspect of it. I think that's all I really wanted to show you for the EM2040. Let's go over to the EK80, because this one is a little bit harder to understand, but it's also very useful. So it's a split beam transducer, which means it sends out one beam, but it reads it as multiple, so you can get angles and intensity. And what you can do with this is that you can measure the seabed hardness, and of course objects in the water, water column, but you can also uh, really accurately measure how big things are, sizes of things and how their volume is. So you think if you're able to identify a fish uh, shoal, you can also say how much volume there is of the fish shoal, and then thereby say, okay, we know how much uh, fish there is, because you can divide by the vo volume of an average fish. There are some caveats to this, though, because you do have to calibrate this very well. You need to find something that you have a known sound profile of hanging underneath the boat and measure it and see how it looks. So that takes time. And uh, we also have to filter objects because things that are closer to the sensor will, of course, reflect sound better, and then they'll look bigger. So that's an issue. We have to make sure that it has been scaled accordingly. But yeah, for this, we can find individual fish. We can find fish shoals. We can find like bubbles. Bubbles show up really well. So if you're looking for gas seeps and that kind of thing, it's really useful. And these, of course, are like the main goals of our object detection algorithms, because this is the things that are useful for the industry and for environmental issues. So what do we really have out of the data? I'm going to try to explain this as intuitively as I can, but it's, uh, let me know if it isn't. We have two axes. We have time on the x-axis, and then we have depth on the y-axis, so it's a 2D data, it's like an image. We like to represent it as an image. And each value in this image will represent how well it reflected sound. So if you call it a scatter value, it just means how well this sound was reflected from the transducer that sent the, uh, this, the beam out. So it creates yeah, a very comprehensive image of the ocean floor dynamics. You have the seabed and you have things that are below the ship. And because it's an image, you think, well, we can use image processing on it. And that is, of course, what we would like to do. 
So this is what a very typical example of data from an EK80 will look like. So the very thick red line is, of course, uh, parts of the water column that reflected sound very well. It's a very hard area. So you would be correct in saying, OK, that's the seabed, most likely correct. So you see the seabed dynamics moving. So as we move our ship towards, uh, or as we move our ship like this, it gets deeper. And then you can see that because you have time on the x-axis and range on the y-axis. And a really good like, uh, uh, rule we have is that you know those little shapes on the right there, like the banana-like shapes? Those are usually fish, individual fish. That's like a code word in Kongsberg, uh, banana equals fish. So that's what we want to find, right? That's what we want to measure, and that's what we want to use, have as a result for our object detection algorithm. Uh, I want to mention uh, CRIMAC. This is a center for research-based innovation in marine acoustics. They are a uh, group started by us, FFI, and IMR which is basically uh, a group that will make open source pipelines, so they're all out on GitHub, for uh, pre-processing uh, acoustic data from EK80 sensors, and making it so you can run machine learning algorithms right on the data. You get SV data, or the sound data, in memory maps that are very efficient, and it's just, it's all very easy and uh, works well. So this is all on GitHub, just Google them. And uh, they also have a couple classification pipelines that build upon the processing pipelines that are like, uh, seabed detectors and fish detectors and stuff like that. So they have a lot of good resources out there if you guys find that you want to research this. And of course, PyOcolab is worth mentioning as well. It's like a Python uh, library. It's very easy to use. Okay, so talking about the SV data again, it's, you could quite see earlier, right, that it's, you, you can kind of visually segment it into uh, where the seabed is and where the fish are. You're able, able to visually identify that. And because you can visually identify it, you think, well, OK, this should be easy for an image processing algorithm to do, too. So uh, what you want to do first is you want to say, OK, things that are hard, that reflect eye data well, are usually objects or the seabed. And you can use that theory to approximate the seabed. You can make a, uh, a um, score system that will say, OK, if something is very hard and very deep, that's usually the seabed. And you can do that for every ping, and then you can filter out the seabed, because you might not be interested in that. And then what you have left is, of course, things that are objects, but not hard, deep objects that are part of the seabed. So you can continue processing on them. And what we will usually do is we'll do noise reduction, because it can be a bit noisy. You know, sound reflects off of things. And then we'll do some clustering based on how uh, the intensity is. So for every fish, you know, uh, each pixel in the fish will be the same ish sound value. It will reflect, reflect sound similarly, no matter where you look. And then it's, of course, worth mentioning, if you are able to find a fish and then you can see how much it reflects sound, you can compare it to some sound profiles that are online. Because people have been researching this for a while and they're able to say, OK, this fish will reflect sound like this and this will reflect it like this. So you're able to do this, a lot of this unsupervised as opposed to having to train a lot of data. This is what like, a pipeline would look like. You have an input uh, echogram. The very thick yellow line would be like a, the seabed, while the little light blue objects would be maybe fish, for example. You can cluster it based on intensity. So things that are close and have a very similar reflectance will be, of course, part of the same object. And then from that point, you can start introducing training and labeling where you say, OK, we're only interested in these clusters that have this profile. And then, of course, you have a full pipeline for prediction of fish or whatever you want to find without too much data. Then you're just, again, labeling clusters. So you're not like having to draw out where it is in the echogram, which is more labor intensive. I'm going to show you a little example of this uh, in practice. You saw earlier our USV, the yellow boat, the sounder. We drove in Odda, or in Eidfjord, uh, back and forth in a fjord like this. And then, of course, you can see that in the echogram data, because these mountains are where the depth was very shallow. So as we got closer to the shore, the depth would get much, much lower. And that would show up in the data like these mountains, because then we would turn around and drive out towards the fjord again, and then the depth would go down again. So it looks kind of funky, but that's hopefully is represented well in this image. I tried to do it as uh, best I could. This is from the sounder you would see, so completely autonomous and very close to the shore. And we wanted to find fish. We wanted to find a brishling. We wanted to find other kinds of fish as well. So we ran the algorithm on it. We, of course, uh, we normalized it. We ran the uh, thresholding based on the intensity. We sort out the seabed. And then we cluster and classify. And then we get out what we have on the right there, which is clustered data and individual fish. Again, that's the banana-ish shape, yeah, green banana that has uh, been cl uh, classified as a type of fish. Uh, and this is done with very little training data, again. So those were the two, like, uh, two instruments and two pipelines I wanted to show off. I think that's us for today. We have a little Q&A slide if you guys want to ask anything. But uh, thank you very much for listening to our nerdiness. <laughs>